compartment syndrome. This is from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version three, by Drs. Lee and Arabi. This is Saka Brahman. I'm narrating, and we already talked about pathophysiology. Very important to understand that and what causes compartment syndrome. But the biggest and most complicated and difficult issue for clinicians is really the diagnosis. You just don't have this easy uh, diagnostic test. I mean, compartment pressure measurements can be made. It's an invasive procedure, and we do it. But it's not like you can just, um, you know, get a simple blood test or uh, get an X-ray picture. It's something that um, takes a little bit of effort, experience, and uh, can be difficult to make a diagnosis. Uh, and the consequences of not making a diagnosis are significant. So um, this is really the crux of this um, of this topic. Now we say it's a clinical diagnosis and requires a high index of suspicion, and that's one of the problems. Right? You don't have this very simple, easy um, uh, diagnostic test that you can just easily get, um, and uh, requires this index of suspicion and getting further confirmatory tests like compartment pressure measurements, for example. You have to look at the history, you have to look at the exam, you have to talk to the patient, you have to recognize which patients are at risk. Um, for starters. Now you have the classic five P's, right? Unfortunately, they're not all totally reliable, right? So what's very painful for one patient may not be as painful for the other patient, right? So one patient could be stoic, one person could be more dramatic. Um, uh, one person could be doing great because of their pain medications and someone else is not getting enough pain medication, right? So pain is difficult to measure. Pallor, difficult to measure. I mean, what's discoloration for one person could be different for somebody else, and of course patients come in all different skin colors. Uh, paralysis requires patient cooperation, right, and that you may not have that, or there could be a nerve injury that's nothing to do with the compartment syndrome. Um, so a lot of these things are hard to measure, right? And the other thing is, a lot of these are signs, especially paralysis, I mean, these are things that if you have a foot drop, you've already gotten some ischemic damage most likely. So what you want to do is try to make a diagnosis before you get to this point, right? Um, so you're going to look with look for pain, um, and you're going to look at compartment pressures, and a lot of your diagnosis is going to be centered on these two things. What about pulses? Well, you should have pulses in any circumstance here. If you don't have pulses, it's... Um, either a very far gone compartment syndrome or another situation happening. This is not what you're waiting for. You're always checking for pulses, but you're not saying, oh, he has pulses, therefore it's not a compartment syndrome. I hope nobody has that impression. Keep in mind that um, sensory changes in paralysis don't occur until ischemia has already been present for a little while. So you'll look for this, but you're not sitting on someone who's got a numb foot and a foot drop that just sort of happened in a swollen leg, right? So really one of the most important things that you're looking for is assessing for pain, right? Pain that's disproportionate to the expected uh, injury, right? So this is something that comes with experience and this is something that um, uh, you have to look for, you have to understand when something is disproportionate and that's tough. Well, a lot, uh, a lot of things that you can do are check for pain with passive stretch, right? So we'll dorsiflex and plantar flex the toes, maybe the ankle, uh, see if we can identify that there's pain with stretch of the muscle compartment, right? Uh, hopefully you can identify if pain is progressively getting worse or better. So whereas it's hard to pin a qu you know, quantity on pain, and we use pain scales, but it's still very subjective, you often can still get an idea, a patient can tell you if it's getting better or getting worse, or if simple immobilization relieved it or not. Now this is an important point. Um, pain could be worse with elevation, and you have to be very careful with this. So if you think about it, elevation can decrease your perfusion pressure, right? So you lift the leg up, a little bit to help swelling go down or help prevent excessive soft tissue swelling, that's fine. But you hang the leg up in the air, or you hang a forearm up in the air, 
you have to be really careful that you're not decreasing the perfusion pressure to the point that you could precipitate a compartment syndrome. And this is the, this is the basis, actually, of the so-called well-leg compartment syndrome, right? Well-leg compartment syndrome. And this is something that happens when you use the hemilithotomy position in a uh, traction table when you're nailing a femur or something like that. And the well leg is sitting up there for too long and you can get a compartment syndrome. What about paresthesias? Of course you look for this, right? Um, if it's a compartment syndrome happening, it could be because of nerve ischemia. Also keep in mind you could have a blunt trauma or you know, a laceration or something that could cause a nerve injury and that can make it complicated and not be a compartment syndrome at all. Of course, if you have uh, tissue ischemia, uh, you can lose function, a foot drop, for instance, as an example, and uh, of course that could be due to compartment syndrome. What about palpation? Well, this is really unreliable, unfortunately. We do it, you have to do it, and if you're experienced, you feel like you should have some sense of what's you know, not swollen at all and what's very swollen, but there's uh, actually a lot of variability here, and it's just really tough to say is this swollen or is it you know tense what does that mean I mean it's one thing if somebody's not swollen at all and the leg is exactly like the other leg uh, the non-injured uh, you know extremity uh, but it's another thing to say well you know it's pretty swollen but it's not that tense when you start saying that then it's really not that clear uh, and one person could be you know, relatively heavy and have uh, an inch of adipose tissue confusing the picture or you have somebody who's relatively thin uh, that your fingers are much closer to the compartments uh, and it's going to feel different. What about actual tissue pressures? Well um, this is uh, really one of the uh, cornerstones of diagnostic testing that we have. So normal pressures are about 0 to 4 millimeters mercury and about 8 to 10 with exertion that is you know if you're running or something like that so there's a couple of theories of what pressures are pathologic well absolute pressure theory basically says if you get to a pressure of 30 that's indicative of a compartment syndrome happening others say that um, it's maybe a different number but then you also have this pressure gradient theory and I think most of us Oops, excuse me. I think my pen's not working. So I think most of us subscribe to this theory, at least those colleagues of mine I'm usually interacting with, which is that um, you look for the compartment pressure with respect to the diastolic pressures, right? So if the diastolic pressure is 70, Right, and intercompartmental uh, intercompartmental pressure is 65. Well, that's a delta P of only five. And regardless of whose theory you subscribe to, in the pressure gradient theory, that delta P is far too low, and um, therefore you're you're uh, likely to be having a compartment syndrome. So uh, most of us we get compartment pressure measurements, and then we look at that with respect to diastolic pressure. Okay, so originally fasciotomies were frequently done for absolute pressures greater than 30. Uh, then we really started looking for delta P's and Margaret McQueen in Edinburgh, Scotland was one of the big proponents of doing this. And, um, you know, in her studies also, it's important to note, because we don't do this, uh, in this in the United States as much, uh, but they do, or were doing certainly, continuous pressure measurements or continuous pressure monitoring and saying that you can't just get these isolated static pressures, but you had to get continuous pressure monitoring, like an indwelling pressure monitor. Um, uh, so uh, they found that um, you had to look at this uh, delta P of uh, 30, mill 30 millimeters, and if you got less than that, then you potentially have a compartment syndrome. Now it is important to understand, and if you look at this um, here, it shows how the closer you get to the fracture, right, the x-axis, the fracture site is at zero in the center, and the pressure on the y-axis, you can see as you clo get closer to the fracture, 
in all compartments, the pressure goes up, right? So the tissue pressures are highest at the site or within five centimeters of the injury. So whenever you check compartment pressure measurements, you got to check somewhere near the fracture site. Just because you're in the compartment actually doesn't give you the same pressure. It doesn't mean that that pressure is the same throughout the compartment. Let's put it that way. So it's not uniform. So who's at high risk? Now this is really important. You know, we talked about this index of suspicion. So here's where you have to sort of um, look at the history, look at the patient, look at the fracture pattern. So obviously higher energy fractures uh, maybe have more severe comminution, um, maybe fractures with joint extension, segmental injuries, certain types of tibial plateau fractures such as the medial fracture dislocations have a high risk for compartment syndrome. Uh, floating knees. So high energy fractures are at risk for compartment syndrome. This is the other one. So uh, patients with impaired sensation are not, I think, per se at a higher risk of compartment syndrome, but they're at a higher risk of missing a compartment syndrome, right? So just because a patient's unconscious doesn't mean that, you know, their leg is more likely to get a compartment syndrome, but you can't use your clinical judgment as well, right? So I just spoke all about pain, 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 pain. Well, somebody who's intubated, right, or somebody who's, you know, just got, um, you know, a boatload of Ativan or somebody who's uh, had a head injury uh, or is unconscious because they came in on PCP, I mean, you can't get a good history you can't understand how their pain is doing. I would even say that if you have a patient who speaks a different language and from another culture, um, you may not be communicating as well. You may think that, well, they're kind of doing okay, but they're just a little bit anxious and you're not recognizing it. And it's not kind of, you know, uh, making its way through the language line interpreter service that you're using. So this is where the clinical suspicion has to be elevated. You, know, you have to think, okay, is there potentially a reason why we have to look more aggressively like getting compartment pressure measurements in one of these scenarios because pain is now kind of out the window. Can't use it, right? A couple of other things. Presence of an open fracture does not rule out the presence of a compartment syndrome. Okay, so um, you still have to make sure you don't miss it. Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, Margaret McQueen found there was no significant difference in compartment pressures between open and closed tibial fractures. Um, so you have to consider open fractures as being risk for compartment syndrome. So um, again, delta P uh, less than 30. Now there are, uh, we're coming back to compartment pressure measurements here. Won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, you can do a needle uh, infusion technique, not done as much anymore. Typically we use uh, some type of uh, needle uh, manometer. Um, this is the uh, one that we use for many years at our institution. We now use a disposable one. This so-called striker device is the reusable one shown below with the sterile needles and the reusable um, measurement device. Uh, like I said, we now use a uh, very small disposable uh, device that um, has worked very well for us. And uh, you can learn how to use that in a separate technique video. Uh, but uh, again, this can be done with a 18-gauge um, needle or side-ported needle as shown here. And of course, you want to go within five centimeters of the fracture site or injury site. Um, and make sure you compare all four compartments. Um, in, the, in the lower leg, you want to look at the anterior compartment, the lateral compartment, the deep posterior and superficial posterior compartments. Um, the anterior compartment and deep posterior in the leg is usually, are, are usually where um, uh, the, the highest pressures are going to be found and in the form it's usually in the volar compartment. Um, so, you know, my pen is, you know, my pen is not working. I apologize. Actually, my arrow is working. So, so where to measure? So, of course, in the anterior compartment here, lateral compartment, and then usually for the posterior compartments, you know, what I like to usually do is, you know, come on the medial side, 
All right, superficial posterior here, and then you keep going in as the deep posterior, right? So if you have the leg oriented this way and you have your needle coming in this way, usually if you come behind the tibia, you get superficial and then you go down into deep. So as we said, distance from the fracture affects pressure. It goes down as you go further away from the uh, compartment. Here you can see the compartments shown in a more uh, simple schematic. This is just a cross section in the mid leg. And this is with more of the anatomy um, sort of filled in for you. And you should really become familiar with this because, you know, when you do fasciotomies, obviously you need to know where you are and that you're releasing the right tissues. In fact, I'll go back for a second. We'll talk about this more in the next video, but one of the most important things is release of the deep posterior compartment. A lot of times people come in medially uh, over here, they release the superficial posterior compartment, and they never really get into that deep posterior compartment. All right, so we're going to get into treatment in the next video. Um, thanks.